It's time for Security Now. Steve Gibson's here with a, yet another one of his amazing, brilliant lectures on how the Internet works. Today we discuss TCP, plus a fascinating discussion of the DigiNotar hack, the inside details, all coming up next on Security Now. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for security now is provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for security now is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Security Now with Steve Gibson. Episode 317, recorded September 8th, 2011, TCP Part 1. Security Now is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. And by Carbonite Online Backup. Automatic and unlimited backup for your computer files with anytime, anywhere access. For a free trial plus two free months with purchase, go to Carbonite.com. Offer code SECURITYNOW. It's time for Security Now, the show that protects you and your loved ones online. And here's a guy who does it, Mr. Steve Gibson of GRC.com. He's a guy who discovered the first spyware, coined the term spyware, wrote the first anti-spyware program. Steve, we're in. Welcome, first of all. <laughs> Hello, Leo. Great to be back with you again, as always. Thank you. And as uh, we've been talking about, we're in a, kind of a different set here. Um, my office is uh, being busy being soundproofed. I guess I screamed too much. <laughs> They say I yell. I, I don't know. And, uh, ah, you're just excitable. <laughs> that's what I think. And, and you're uh, drinking coffee, so that, 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 that's, that doesn't help that's either. That's part of the problem. Now, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. Mr. Sexy <laughs> Venti yeah, Latte. I, six shots now. Six yeah. shots. So, did that, But basically, did you start at one, then two, then three, then four? I mean, are you ramping up? Are you building up a tolerance? No. No. I just like the taste. <laughs> I drink it. It's like reading Playboy for the articles. I drink it. For the taste. That's right. I don't look at the pictures. Mmm. Ah. So uh, they know, though, when you come in the door at Starbucks, they say, oh, here's the six-shot guy, right? Oh, yeah. They fire <laughs> up the machine. Actually, they turn on the spare. Bring it. Yeah, really, exactly. Bring in reinforcements. Here comes Gibson. So today we are going to start uh, a, another part of what you've done so well, which is these kind of basic educational how technology works segments. Well, yeah, how the Internet works specifically. Um, we've talked about the underlying packet-oriented operation of the net. We then talked about, while well, you were in on jury duty, about the ICMP and UDP protocols, mm. which are built on top of that. Today, we're going to start the beginning of discussion of the internet's number one most used most important protocol which is tcp the um transmission control protocol and it's much more complicated than the other ones so this one is i'm calling it tcp part one let's get connected we'll just we're just going to attempt to explain really clearly what TCP's goals are and the process of of initiating a connection and sort of talk about the most important aspects of that and also what the hackers have done because it's interesting that every aspect of TCP has been attacked because it is pervasive since it's the glue that connects everything essentially it's been a, a big target for attack so we'll look at 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 how attackers have um, have tried to leverage the way TCP works, but we also have a week's worth of first amazing news on the whole Digi Notar wow. nightmare that we began to talk about last week. You'll remember, Leo, that I said, you know, based on what I've seen in the source code of the Mozilla and the Chrome browsers, we haven't been 
told the whole story, we will be revisiting this. Well, we, <laughs> we didn't waste any time because there's been a whole bunch of more information has come out. So we've got a bunch of other up in, in, sort of interesting updates. We'll catch everybody up on the Digi Notar news and then plow into TCP. Well, oh, and, and I have to say at the top of the show, where is Apple? Yeah. Apple is completely absent from this. Everybody else has been scurrying around and fixing their browsers. And I fired up my Mac just this morning, just before the podcast, to make sure that Apple hadn't suddenly woken up. I mean, people are, PC World has, has an article wondering why Apple hasn't responded at all to, to this, which is now more than uh, a week and a half old. It's crazy. Hmm. But no, no, no word, no, not a peep. Yeah. From Apple. Yeah. Uh, well, we're going to talk about that and and talk about. The, the, apparently, we know that we know who did the Digi Notar hack. So we'll find out about that too in just a little bit with Steve Gibson. Uh, when we talk about security, we got to talk about backing up. That's that's really the key, I think, uh, to a good security strategy. If the worst happens, at least you've got your data, right? That's what it's all about. It's protecting your stuff. We all have things on our hard drives that are precious to us, whether they're photos of our kids or. Uh, our wedding photos, our travel photos, or financial records, or that resume you just finished and polished for hours on end. Think about those files on your hard drive. When were they last backed up? And where were they last backed up? You know, if you're not doing automatic backups, chances are it's just when you think about it, it might be weeks between backups, it be months, in some cases years. In some cases, let's face it, never. Uh, furthermore, if you're backing up to an external drive or a USB drive right next to your computer, that's, that's good. In fact, I, I do that and I recommend it. But it's not enough because if there is a big disaster, a fire, a flood, these things happen. We're hearing about them all the time in the news. Hurricanes coming. Uh, that backup will get destroyed along with the original. The best backups are off-site. Anybody who's got a backup strategy has to have at least one automatic off-site backup, and that's where Carbonite comes in. Very affordable. We're not talking about an arm and a leg here. Less than 5 bucks a month. $59 for a year. Actually, I'll tell you how to get it for 14 months for 59 bucks in just a second. Uh, it's automatic. It's Mac or PC. It's very easy to restore. In fact... I love the stat. They give the stat. Seven billion people have had, seven billion files have been restored by Carbonite online backup since they started a few years ago. Seven billion files that would have been lost otherwise. It's secure. It's private. You encrypt uh, using strong encryption. It's also SSL during the transmission. And anytime you're online, it will politely, it won't tie up your system or slow you down, back up your files. I think that's, I think those are the highlights of the, uh, of the benefits of Carbonite. Now what I'd like you to do is try it for free. No credit card, nothing needed. Just go to Carbonite.com. Use the offer code security now. And you get two weeks free. No credit card needed. You know, it's not one of those things where they say, now we got your credit card. No, no you don't have to give them any information. Just security now, the offer code. And, but if you decide to buy, do, 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 please do the free trial. But if you decide to buy, use security now again. And you'll get 14 months for the price of 12 $59. Two months free. And all you have to do is say security now. It is backup done right. you got to back it up to get it back. So please, if you're talking about security, you've got to consider backup. And the best way to do it, Carbonite.com. So, Steve, Digi Notar. I saw that, th that they think it was an Iranian hacker involved. Well, we're going to talk about that. It is, it's been confirmed pretty much that it's the same guy who did the Komodo hack um, this last March. He's claiming um, it anyway, right? Well, he's claiming it, and he's also offered some proof. The, the people that DigiNotar brought in to, to check over, like, like to do the analysis of their own systems, did find some, some fingerprint information left behind mm. that was identical to what was used in the Komodo attack. Um, and I've got two really interesting posts that I'm going to share with our listeners from this guy. Uh, I always like to start off with, by talking about security updates. And across the board, there have been updates in direct response to this problem. So Microsoft Chrome's up to date, has, uh, IE's up to date. Yep, Microsoft issued an out-of-cycle update and pushed out to all their supported platforms to, to remove... Um, Digi Notar's um, trust 
from Windows. Mozilla, we talked about 6.0.1 last week, right. which was the first phase of this. Now we have 6.0.2, which is the second phase. And we'll be talking in detail about, about what they did. But again, really, I mean, notably absent from the party is Apple. And now that's probably I mean, not a problem if you're using Safari, Apple's browser on Windows, because they use the uh, Microsoft certs. So uh, your IE update will fix that, but it's a big problem on the Mac. Well, yeah. And I mean, I would say, you know, all ye who value security, abandon Safari. Hmm. I mean, I, it's just, you know, switch to Chrome or to Firefox or something. You know, I mean, the, there, there have been blog postings where people are showing how to remove the DigiNotar trust. I have also seen uncon uh, other unconfirmed reports that doing so doesn't fix the problem. So th the only advice I have for people for now is just over on the Mac platform, just suspend your use of Safari until Apple responds. I mean, it's, it's, I, I, I just can't figure out what Apple is doing, why they're alone in not having responded to this. And, and we'll talk in a second about what this is. I have some other stuff I want to do first so, so that okay. we can give D D DigiNotar enough time. There was a sort of a, a strange DNS hijack which occurred, which a lot of people tweeted me about to make sure I knew about it. The, the thing that was of concern was that people were saying that hundreds of websites had been defaced. Um, I actually got an email through m the, my regular GRC channel saying that UPS.com had apparently been defaced and the register.co.uk had been defaced. And, and so essentially UPS, Vodafone, the register.co.uk, Acer.com, Betfair.com, National Geographic, Dot com and telegraph.co.uk were defaced. And that's all. There were reports that there were hundreds of websites, but it turns out that a, a, a site that was tracking this was had a, 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 a history of, of other defacements and hacks, and the press didn't properly understand what this third-party website was showing and so they were saying oh this is a hundreds when in fact it was it was only that little handful but what they all have in common is that they all use the same DN, the, the, the same domain registrar which was net names um, Turkish attackers were able to hack into the DNS management panel of those net name user accounts using an SQL injection. And they modified for those sites the, the DNS pointers. They, they took wherever their, their, their registered DNS was and then re, essentially overwrote them, pointing them to NS1 dot and NS2 dot, and then a name I can't even pronounce, I won't try, it's <laughs> Y U M U R T A K A B U G U dot com. Yumurta <laughs> Bugaboo. There you go. <laughs> and um, and those then pointed people to this defaced page. So uh, the register, I, I saw a, a relieved note that the register posted saying, well, as far as we know, we haven't been hacked at all. It's that our U. It's that our DNS got redirected. So I mean, for UPS to have theirs redirected was an embarrassment and a problem. No kidding. But as soon as this got fixed, the, all that had to happen was that they just re reset their DNS, and after it was able to propagate out through the internet, people would have you know been returned to the proper uh, website. So this wasn't a penetration of those sites. It was actually a penetration of their registrars that unfortunately had a security problem, and uh, we'll be hearing a lot more about security problems on on servers here in a second. Um, I I got uh, my attention drawn thanks to another Twitter posting uh, from Drew, who posts as Doc House Seven. He turned me on to a very nice looking Finnish IT security 
banking Trojan detector. It's at fitsec.com, fitsec.com slash blog. And at the moment, it uh, it's the top blog entry there. Um, it's a very small and nice um, detector of the top five banking Trojans. The um, uh, Zeus, Spy Eye, Carb, Erp, Gozi, and Patcher. And what I like about it is that it's small. It's less than a meg. It's 768K. And it only takes about less than a minute to run so it, it, because it's not rummaging through your hard drive it's just doing an in-memory check of the processes running in your system now to see whether the banking trojan any of those five banking trojans might be present in your system that is present and running so it's very simple and quick to run and i re recommend it for windows users so fitsec.com slash blog um, uh, which I hadn't known about before. So cool. uh, thank you, Drew. Um, and finally, this just sort of popped up on my radar. This was the first time I had seen a, um, a U.S. cert to NIST vulnerability, at, you know, with, with a CVE index number, which directly, res um, directly related to something that was arguably health threatening um there is an un re reading from this cve um statement it said an unspecified vulnerability in medtronic paradigm wireless insulin pump models 512 522 what? 712 and 722 Jeez, Louise. oh i know L listen to this an unspecified vulnerability in this wireless insulin pump allows remote attackers to modify the delivery of an insulin bolus dose and cause a denial of service, which and then it says parens adverse health uh, uh, yeah. adverse human health outcome via unspecified vectors involving wireless communications and knowledge of the device's serial number. As demonstrated by Jerome Radcliffe at the Black Hat USA conference in August. Note, the vendor, Medtronic, has disputed the severity of the issues, saying, quote, We believe the risk of deliberate, malicious, or unauthorized manipulation of medical devices is extremely low. And we want it to be, of course. We strongly believe it would be very difficult for a third party to wirelessly tamper with your insulin pump <laughs> you <laughs> would be able so. to yeah you would be able to detect tones on the insulin right. pump that weren't intentionally programmed and could intervene accordingly you'd hear you'd hear it being reprogrammed in other words so, i don't really know what they mean yeah. but let's i just i thought well, as i was reading through anything to see if there's anything new that i ought to bring to anyone to people's attention i thought okay wait a minute so now we have a hack of a wireless insulin delivery system uh, by wireless attackers. Now, the good news is they have to apparently know the device's serial number. And the so, range on these isn't great. I mean, you couldn't sit outside the hospital and, and target or, these guys. Or across the planet. Right, yes. right, right. Yeah. So, you know, that's good news. But still, we would like to have our insulin pump security yes. uh, a little higher than that. Okay, so from where we left off last week, which was that that we knew from looking at the source code of Mozilla with Firefox and Google with Chrome, that that a bunch of certificates had been been created without apparently the knowledge of this this uh, Digi Notar certificate authority in the Netherlands. Um, now what we know from the report which has been issued by Fox IT, who is the independent auditing firm that DigiNotar hired to, to come in and analyze their breach, is that a number of DigiNotar servers were compromised by intruders who obtained administrative rights through the interval between June 17th and July 22nd. So, first of all, 
That's a that's six weeks essentially of time during which bad guy or guys had access to the ability to produce fraudulent certificates signed by an, an authority that all of our browsers at the time trusted completely. So that's really bad. DigiNotar detected this intrusion on July 19th and said nothing to no one, mm. which is really the problem. Mm -hmm. And I will get back to that in a minute because in the, fi in, in the Mozilla blog, the Mozilla security blog, this is one of the reasons they've issued a second update to Firefox is they're not pulling any punches any longer with DigiNotar. They did more of a surgical removal of trust, which I described in detail last week. Now it's just gone. They're not, they're, they want nothing to do with these folks any longer because of the way DigiNotar handled the breach. It's one thing to get breached, you know, it can happen. But it's an entirely different thing if, if somebody who is trusted doesn't immediately belly up to the bar and take responsibility for what has happened, and these guys stayed silent. What we now know is that, five, are you sitting down? 534 fraudulent certificates were issued. It was just a party. Yeah. And somewhere, if you scroll down uh, the, the file I've given you, Leo, you'll find a, a CSV link there under govcert.nl. You might want to open it up and, and find some choice ones while I continue to okay. talk to our <laughs> listeners. And Will do. So, so you can mention those. So, okay, so the first known mention of any activity using these certificates was what we talked about last week back in August with a Google forum posting where an Iranian user reported being warned by the Google Chrome browser that there was something wrong with his certificate. Well, that was because it was revoked. And that was a certificate created on July 10th. So, so there was a revocation of the certificate by DigiNotar, who began to realize that something was wrong, yet even then they said nothing. Investigating further, Fox IT found that the offending certificate was revoked on August 29th, but but um, by that point, it had affected three, it had directly been used in 300,000 unique IP addresses of users, 99% of which were in Iran. But look at why these, AOL.com, Komodo.com, Google.com, LogMeIn.com, Microsoft.com, Mozilla.org, Skype.com, Thought.com. I mean, these are all, I mean, and, and, and the number of certificates, I mean, Equifax Root CA, 40 certificates. <laughs> it's a who's who of yeah. the Internet. Um, and so these guys had weeks to synthesize fraudulent certificates, yeah. all signed by somebody we all trusted. Right. In, in two weeks, we're going to talk about, we're going to revisit the issue of this whole hierarchical certificate authority trust model because the problems that we're seeing are finally beginning to come to the attention of the industry. But, but this, and, is, this is my question. I, I, I see all these uh, certificates, you know, wordpress.com, uh, twitter.com. But so they've got a certificate. That means they could pose as this site. Correct. And how difficult, what would they do? How would they do that man in the middle attack? How would they grab your internet connection? So all you need, the only requirement for leveraging these certificates is that you you somehow you somehow are able to 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 get into the traffic flow i click so, a link in other words well yes. uh, you as the user if you were in iran hmm. and you you attempted to go over a, an ssl connection to google 
you are passing through Iranian controlled ISPs. That's where the certificate is installed, ah. so that there, there's, there, there's a proxy set up, which which sees that you are trying to get to Google.com, and it connects to your browser instead of just allowing the traffic to go through to Google.com. Your browser then receives a certificate from apparently Google.com signed by DigiNotar, right. and and if for example, you had you were running Certificate Patrol that we that I am a fan of and and I've talked about now for many months. If you were running Certificate Patrol, it would pop up at that point and say, "Wait a minute, I last saw Google's certificate signed by Verisign. Now I'm getting a certificate for Google signed by DigiNotar. Um, oh, and." Their assigned certificate still had two years to go, so it doesn't seem logical that they would have replaced their certificate. And well, actually, Google, Google signs their own. Google is a certificate authority, so it would say the la the last certificate was signed by by Google. Now we're getting a Google certificate, apparently a <coughs> Google certificate signed by somebody else by this this random digi notar certificate authority so so that would have alerted any really security savvy user in iran that something was what was, was going on here instead what happened was while that certificate was in use and being delivered to users in iran digi notar revoked that certificate the, the user's browser checked for revocation, saw that it was revoked. That's what popped up a notice that uh, caused this user to make a forum posting. And that's where the world began to first know that something was going on that, that was not copacetic. So, um, uh, okay, so we've now heard from the guy who did this. Uh, he said... Well, the guy who takes posted, credit for it. We can't prove it. Well, either, and right? it's, it's confirmed. Oh, it is confirmed. Uh, okay. Yes, because he has... He has he used DigiNotar's private <laughs> key to sign an executable, which he posted. Okay. And only that proves he, it. Yes, exactly. So he posted a paste bin. He said, and I'm going to share this because it's, it's, it's interesting and there's lots of details in here. And we get some sense into his psyche. Hi again. I strike back again, huh? <laughs> I told all that I can do it again. The ego I told, of these guys. God. Oh, yeah. I told all in interviews that I still have accesses in Komodo resellers. I told all I have access to most of CAs. You see that words now? You know I have access to four more so high, all caps, profile CAs, which I can issue certificates from them too, which I will. I won't name them. I also had access to Startcom CA. I hacked their server too with so sophisticated methods. He was lucky by being sitting in front of HSM for signing. I will, and, and what he's referring to is that the Startcom C CTO did actually see a hack in process wow. and was able to stop it. And so this guy going on says, I will name just one more, which I still have access, Global Sign. Let me use these accesses and CAs. Later, I'll talk about them too. I won't talk so many detail for now, just I wanted to let the world know that anything, all caps, you do will have consequences. Anything your country did in past, you have to pay for it. Oh, boy. I was sure if I issue those certificates for myself from a company, company will be closed and will not be able to issue certs anymore. Komodo was really, really lucky. Actually, Komodo responded immediately to the nine that that this guy made, we were able to, you know, the the the, the browsers were immediately updated to block those, and and you know, essentially, this leak was plugged. 
Diginotar, of course, the breach was vastly larger and longer, um, and they didn't they didn't take responsibility for it. So they are essentially out of business. So he says, I thought if I issue certs from Dutch Gov CA, they'll lose a lot of money. But I remembered something, and I hacked Diginotar without more thinking in anniversary of that mistake. When Dutch government exchanged 8,000 Muslim for 30 Dutch soldiers and animal Serbian soldiers killed 8,000 Muslims in the same day, Dutch government have to pay for it. Nothing has changed. Just 16 years have been passed. Dutch government's $13 million, which paid for Diginotar, will have to go directly into trash. It's what I can do from KMs away, whatever that means. It's enough for Dutch government for now to understand that one Muslim soldier worth 10,000 Dutch government. Mm. Okay, and says he says, I'll talk technical details of attack later, um, or sorry, of hack later. I don't have time now. But I got access to six-layer network behind Internet servers of DigiNotar, how I found passwords, how I got system privilege in full, patched, and up-to-date system, how I bypassed their N-Cypher net hardware security, their hardware keys, their RSA certificate manager, their sixth-layer internal CERT network, which have no any connection to Internet, how I got full remote desktop connection when there was firewalls that blocked all ports except 80 and 443 and doesn't allow reverse or direct VNC connections and more and more and more. After I explain, you'll understand how sophisticated attack it was. It will be a good hacking course for hackers like Anonymous and Lulzsec. Then we got a smiley face. There was so many zero-day bugs, methods, and skill shows. Have you ever heard of XUDA programming language, which RSA Certificate Manager uses it? No. I heard of it in RSA Certificate Manager, and I learned programming in it in same night. It is so unusual, like greater than sign in all programming language is, but XUDA, it is left curly brace anyway i'll talk about <laughs> you don't have to read the whole Carly. thing i mean i get yeah, the blah, I, blah, blah. I get the, yeah. i get the gist of it however um, what do you think uh, of this guy's skill well he does show one thing which is disturbing he says by the way ask did you know tar about this username slash password combination so he says username is production slash administrator which is the, ad, the domain administrator of certificate network. The password, he claims, is it would be prod admin, P-R-O-D-A-D-M-I-N, except that the O is changed to a zero, oh. the A is changed to an at sign, oh. and the I is changed to a one. So if that was truly the password that that this, this certificate authority that the whole world was trusting yeah. was using to protect their domain, their network domain, then that's very sad. Yeah. That's not, it's not a good password. Uh, not a good <clears> password. <throat> it's basically the login with uh, the standard LEET replacements. Uh, exactly. So, Global Sign, because they were named in this first posting, immediately suspended the issuance of any further certificates. Um, they posted in their blog under what they called an incident response, although at this point it's only a potential incident response. They said on September 5th, 2011, the individual slash group previously confirmed to have hacked several Komodo resellers claimed responsibility for the recent DigiNotar hack. In his message posted on Pastebin, which is what I just read, he also referred to having access to four further high-profile certificate authorities and named GlobalSign as one of the four. GlobalSign takes this claim very seriously and is currently investigating. As a responsible CA, we have decided to temporarily cease issuance 
of all certificates until mm. the investigation is complete. We will post updates as frequently as possible. We apologize for any inconvenience. And to their credit, they hired the same third party to, to, to come in um, this uh, Fox IT, to, since Fox IT now has in, you know, internal confidential information about this attacker and how they were able to penetrate DigiNotar, Global Science said, okay, you know, we're willing to and want to leverage what you've learned. Let us know if we actually have been hacked by this guy. Um, so I, I salute them. And but, but again, does it strike you that this, this guy, uh, I mean, these are a lot of boasts, typical kind of kid hacker boasts. Yes. Does it strike you that this, it, it strikes me just looking at it, this guy might actually know what he's talking about. I think he does. I think his English obviously is yeah, not his native language. Can't judge it on that. No, and um, if anyone's curious, I, I won't drag our listeners through his second posting, but he's made another posting, um, and we have the link in the show notes, where he gives additional details and essentially responds to, on a, on a Q&A-like basis, to the other things which have been posted mm. about him in the interim. So my take is the fact that he, he um, did prove that he has the private key that DigiNotar used to sign their own certificate. He signed an EXE using it, which he posted. Um, it, it, you know, it means that he's the guy. Yeah. Or he got it from someone who is, but very likely uh, he's the guy. And there's so a lot of bravado in this. Point. You know, at the end he says, never forget, I'm just 21. You have to see much more from me. And, you know, there's a lot of boasting and bravado and... Uh, Right, uh, but that's the nature. I mean, it's that's why pretty we, common. That's we, why people do this. That's why we turned the we we coined the term script kitty was because yeah, I mean it's. Well, it's, this guy's more than a script kitty, I would guess. Yeah, he is. Yeah, um, he. Uh, well, dep depending upon what he, you know, he obviously found a way in. It. Uh, the, you know, the remember that, what, years ago, Leo, I stumbled on the just the the number of of root CAs, which were in our browsers. And that's when I just said, okay, stop the presses. Yeah. We're in, we're in trouble. Right. And so there, there's a vulnerability, obviously. Yeah. It just, it, this is too, this is trusting too many people. And, and this no guy sounds politically motivated. I think that's a little scary too. I mean, he sounds like he might be a terrorist in effect, a digital terrorist. He, well, he wants to be called unstoppable genius digital hacker. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's even a good acronym. Um, <laughs> UGDH. <laughs> and now, and, and then the question is, how did, how did one of the certs that he made get put into service at wow. a border that's right. for the Iranian network traffic? Because well, and he addresses that. that. He says that people say this is a governmental hack. He says, no, it's just me all by myself. No governmental yeah. hack involved. Yeah, except that somehow the certs did, you know, that one cert got used. And, I mean, so much so that 300,000 IPs of users, 99% of whom were in Iran, were having their traffic filtered through this bogus certificate. So, you know, the, the pieces don't still add up, but there's more pieces. He gives a, a login and a password that he created on um, uh, a Berkeley... Uh uh, LMI.net uh, server. He says, ask them about that. And he says, I owned all their Linux boxes and got access to all their DNS servers. I am really sharp, powerful, dangerous, and smart. <sighs> really creepy, to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. So, Mozilla, following up, um, said, earlier this week, we revoked our trust in the DigiNotar Certificate Authority from all Mozilla software. Now, that's different from what we discussed last week, where, as I said, they made sort of a surgical, we, we're going to, we're going to suspend trust in the following certificates, mm -hmm. which we, 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 which we know have been compromised. Now they're saying, get a new copy of Mozilla stuff. We're pulling the plug. They said, this is not a temporary suspension. This is a complete removal from our trusted root program. 
Complete revocation of trust is a decision we treat with careful consideration and employ as a last resort. Three central issues informed our decision. One, failure to notify. DigiNotar detected and revoked some of the fraudulent certificates six weeks ago without notifying Mozilla. This is particularly troubling since some of the certificates were issued from our from our own, or uh, issued for our own add-ons.mozilla.org domain. Two, the scope of the breach remains unknown. While we were initially informed by Google that a fraudulent star.google.com certificate had been issued, DigiNotar eventually cons confirmed that more than 200 certificates had been issued against more than 20 different domains. Of course, now we know it's way more than that. So, and, and this says, we now know that the attackers also issued certificates from another of DigiNotar's intermediate certificates without proper logging. It is therefore impossible for us to know how many fraudulent certificates exist or which sites are targeted. Three, the attack, the attack is not theoretical. Mm -hmm. We have received multiple reports of these certificates being used in the wild. Mozilla has a strong history of working with CAs to address shared technical challenges as well as responding to and containing breaches when they do arise. In an incident earlier this year, we worked with Komodo to block a set of misissued certificates that were detected, contained, and reported to us immediately. In DigiNotar's case, by contrast, we have no confidence that the problem had been contained. Furthermore, their failure to notify leaves us deeply concerned about our ability to protect our users from future breaches. And then they, 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 they talk about this, um, the um, subsidiary, which is uh, Stat der um, Nederlanden certificates, saying DigiNotar issues certificates as part of the Dutch government's PKI overhide that is the PKI government program. These certificates are issued from a different DigiNotar controlled intermediate and chain up to the Dutch government CA, which is this Stadt der um, Nederlanden. The Dutch government's computer emergency response team, GovCert, indicated that these certificates are issued independently of DigiNotar's other processes and that in their assessment, these had not been compromised. The Dutch government therefore requested that we exempt these certificates from the removal of trust, which we agreed to do in our initial security update earlier this week. That was what I was talking about, about this surgical removal. That was the 6.0.1 update to Firefox. The Dutch government has since audited DigiNotar's performance and rescinded this assessment. We are now removing the exemption for these certificates, meaning that all DigiNotar certificates will be untrusted by Mozilla products. We understand that other browser vendors are making similar changes, <laughs> except Apple, apparently. We're also working with our Dutch localizers and the Bits of Freedom group in the Netherlands to contact individual site operators using affected certificates. The integrity of the SSL system cannot be maintained in secrecy. Incidents like this one demonstrate the need for active, immediate, and comprehensive communication between CAs and software vendors to keep our collective users safe online. Signed by Jonathan Nightingale, Director of Firefox Engineering. Mm. So, you know, this has been a significant event in, in the history of the way the internet works because of the nature of this trust model which we have for SSL. It is we've got all over the world are authorities that we that we are trusting to to issue and sign certificates which web servers hold in order to assert their identity to 
we users when we connect to them. Our browsers then trust those signers of those web server certificates. If that, if, if, if that trust is broken, then our recourse is to stop trusting anything they do. The problem, of course, is all the people who legitimately purchase DigiNotar certificates are, are no longer trusted by Mozilla and increasingly by any other browsers because they bought their certificate from somebody who turned out to be untrustworthy and, and sadly, who didn't accept responsibility for this immediately, which is what, you know, has really shaken people. And basically, this company's probably gone. They're, mm. they're now out of business. Mm. Microsoft's emergency update, they're out of, um, uh, uh, out of cycle update, did exactly the same thing. Uh, this is advisory uh, 2607712, where, the, where Microsoft said in their very sort of generic, bland way, Microsoft is continuing to investigate this issue. Based on preliminary investigation, Microsoft is providing an update for all supported releases of Microsoft Windows that revokes the trust of the following DigiNotar root certificates by placing them into the Microsoft Untrusted Certificate Store. And so this is the DigiNotar root CA, DigiNotar root CA G2, DigiNotar PKI overhide CA, um, and and two others, basically those ones I just mentioned, where the Dutch government said, okay, it looks like that we can't keep trust even on those. Hmm. So I imagine that Windows users with uh, currently supported uh, security platforms have will have received that update, and uh, that's something that you will want to apply. And uh, uh, you read through a bunch of those. There was a star.star.com. <laughs> so, I mean, that's wow, pretty much that's everything. Star.star.org, <laughs> star uh, and star.android.com. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just, it's everybody, essentially, 500 plus certificates. So, uh, the good news is anybody who has, has received the update from Microsoft and rebooted Windows, anybody who's updated to Firefox 6.0.2 on whatever platform, uh, and Chrome are all safe. Uh, inexplicably, Safari users are not, hmm. um, unless you're on Windows. But over in the Mac, I just can't, I just can't understand why we've heard nothing from Apple. But you know, that's the case. Do we know? And, do we know how many? Um, I guess we couldn't possibly know how many attacks are based on this. Um, there, there, the e, um, the EFF has this SSL observatory, which is which is used to to track the use of certificates. And that's what the Mozilla people have used in order to give them some handle on the use of, of certificates. So that has been queried a lot in order to, to track the use of these certificates. But um, it's, and remember, to use them, you have to arrange to have them, have them delivered to a user's browser rather than the website the legitimate website that the, that the user's browser is trying to connect to. So it is all about man-in-the-middle attacks. It's about intercepting traffic. So you, you, have, to, you have to be in a place where you, you, can, you can intercept traffic going in both directions, and that's pretty much an ISP on, you know, either at the, at the, the user's local level or at the the nation state border level that's where i mean that's how these certs end up being used um, i i really think the guy was you know went overboard to issue himself so many certificates uh, one wonders <laughs> how, how how really how, how, he went overboard what a shock <laughs> one wonders how long this could have been i mean the only the, the only way this eva is valuable is if the CA that signed the fraudulent certificate continues to be trusted by the browsers. So you really want to just sort of sneak in and do this without being detected, right. ideally. Well, he um, uh, it's pretty clear that he's self-aggrandizing and he wants the yep. attention. He's not probably, you know, the good news is probably that he's not doing this 
uh, maybe is to hack. Now, it's also possible, and, and Eon pointed this out in the chat room, that this whole paste bin manifesto could be disinformation. It could be a government, in fact, doing this, but wants people to think it's a, you know, kind of cra cracked up individual. That's a very, very good point. We yeah. don't know otherwise. We, we have no we idea. Do, we, and we do know that somehow... 300,000 Iranian users or 300,000 IPs inside of Iran did have one of these certificates used to allow someone to to essentially hack into all of their Google accounts, right. which is what this meant. Which the government because, might well have wanted to do, looking yeah, for dissidents. Yeah, and remember that the way Google maintains login is that there's a cookie which would, would have been, which any attacker who had this certificate and a man in the middle position on, on, the, on the traffic flow, they would have grabbed their, their Google login cookie and then been able to impersonate them across any Google services that that, that user was using. So that's a very powerful hack. None of the people that he gives out passwords to have admitted that this, you know, well, I guess, I mean, we know that because he used a, a key, a, a private key, that he had access to this, this data. Yeah. So, so we know that this is a legitimate paste bin posting. We just don't know if it's disinformation or misdirection or really there we, is a, we know no, a Exactly. Key. We don't know who the individual yeah. is, if it is an individual. Right. But we know that, that whoever posted this has, you know, has, has proven that they were inside of DigiNotar. Right. And uh, as as uh, a number Zephyr I think posted in our, in our chat room, it doesn't. The guy doesn't really matter. What matters is what the hack was, how it happened, the failure to protect us, all of that. Much more so than who did it. Yeah, and again, in in um, I I got a, a tweet from uh, someone who uh, communicates with me through Twitter, Walid uh, Damani, who tweeted. We've talked about him before, yeah. Yes, he tweeted from Lebanon saying, the question on my mind is how trustworthy are other CAs? Mm -hmm. Like DigiNotar, other CAs are not uncompromisable. And my thought is, well, it's worse than that. Because, for example, in the United States, we have now, we know that we have legislation, the whole Patriot Act stuff, where, where our government is able to issue orders for for corporate entities to behave as the government wants them to and to prevent them from saying anything. So who's to say that right. VeriSign, that Network Solutions, that GoDaddy, that, 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 that other trusted certificate authorities haven't issued certificates on behalf of our government or other governments, I mean, I've you know, I, I, again, I've said I've I've poked fun at the Hong Kong Post Office, but you know, they're they're able, any the, the the fundamental problem here is that is that we're our our browsers are trusting a a huge network of third parties, who, and the nature of this architecture is. Every single one of them must be perfect mm. in order for the system to work. Well, that is a bad model. So in two weeks, we're going to revisit this. We're going we're to look at this, the, the certificate authority trust model, past, present, and future, because people are beginning to talk about alternative ways of setting things up. Yeah, and, and in fact, that's what this kid says, if this is a real kid, in his post is, this breaks SSL, this breaks the, this breaks the Internet. And yeah. if I could do this, then you, then you really have to. And he also, of course, asserts he's got a perfect system that would work, but he's not going to share it with us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so in other news, um, I did want to update our listeners about my off-the-grid project. Um, last week, you'll remember that I mentioned I was going to be working on what I called an ultra-high entropy pseudo-random number generator. The reason being that there are so many Latin squares possible, I want the system which is online to be able to get to them all, potentially. And if we only use a, a standard pseudo-random number generator, there just isn't enough bits of state in the pseudo-random number generator 
to allow it to access all of those Latin squares. So I did write a pseudo random number generator in JavaScript, which is much faster than what I had before. It has 1,536 bits of entropy, and it has just successfully passed a multiple batteries of independent testing uh, by the, the, the denizens of the uh, GRC news group over in the GRC.think tank news group. They ran it through the Fermilab, the Die Hard, and the Die Harder tests, and it passed with flying colors. In some cases, they were giving it um, multiple gigabytes of, that is giving these tests, multiple gigabytes of data generated by this pseudo random number generator and it's passed. So we now have a, a, a very solid new uh, high entropy pseudo random number generator, which I'll be bringing online. There is a new link um, underneath the uh, block of links on the off the grid pages, if anyone's curious, uh, to a page where that uh, new ultra high entropy pseudo random number gen generator is located. Uh, and, of course, it's free for anyone to use who has an application for it. Not easy to say ultra-high entropy pseudo-random number generator. No, we I've might... been practicing that. <laughs> I think an acronym is called for here. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I did also want to mention the, uh, this, the cool little embedded um, ARM Cortex-M3 board, which was sold out. Um, last week when we talked, they got 50 in, they sold them out immediately, they got 50 in again, and let's see, there's, last time I refreshed the page, there were four left from the second batch of 50, oh, now there's three at this point, <laughs> wow. so if anyone listening live wants one, uh, it's lpctools.com, um, and it's the LPC 1769 LPC Espresso board. And there's three left. And I imagine they'll get some more when those are gone. And I have to say, I'm tickled that our listeners are hardware hackers to the degree that they are. Um, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some fun together playing with that as soon as I'm able to, to spend some time over there. So Pretty cool. And by the yeah. way, they now say, as talked about on Steve Gibson's Security Now, <laughs> <laughs> episode 315. So actually, there is yep, a it, much more, a much deeper uh, discussion of what you can do with these on 315. Yeah, and um, as, as they, when they were sold out, they said, well, we're sold out again, thanks to Steve Gibson. So we'll have more <laughs> in soon. <laughs> Uh, we've created um, a, we've really created a run on the uh, espresso board. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's, it's just very cool. And for twenty nine ninety five, it's just it's a beautiful little thing with all the software being free. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share a note I received on August thirty first, so about a week and a half ago, from a Terry J LeBlanc, who shared his Spinrite success. He said, "Thanks, Steve. I haven't worked with Spinrite in quite a few years. Then I needed to run Check Disk." on my Dell Optiplex 755 over the weekend. And check disk would hang mm -hmm. at 36% during phase five, checking the available free space. No matter how long I let it run, check disk would not continue. It would not finish. So I thought of Spinrite, accessed your website, bought it and downloaded it, created the ISO image, burned a bootable CD. I booted from the CD and got an opcode error. Researching the error on the internet, I found references to others with the Optex, uh, uh, the Optiplex 755 boxes trying to run Spinrite, getting that error hmm. that indicated that changing the BIOS from RAID-AHCI to RAID-ATA would eliminate the opcode error. Hmm. So. I changed the BIOS setting and restarted from the CD. Sure enough, Spinrite came right up with the familiar DOS interface I had not seen in years. <laughs> Spinrite ran successfully at level two. I restarted the workstation, ran check disk successfully, and booted up normally. Problem solved. I'm using it right now. Spinrite and the other tools from GRC have helped me so many times over the years. I'm happy that you're still around and still making these tools available. I'm happy to have Spinrite back in my toolbox. Great job, folks. Keep up the good work. Thanks, 
Terry LeBlanc. That's nice. So, so did you know you. that uh, little bug? What has to run in a tappy mode, not H AHCI? Is that? Yeah. Um, wh what wh What's happened is, over the years, bugs have crawled into BIOSes, uh. and they're not being found because there are not that many programs any longer like Spinrite that depend upon the BIOS. Right, right. So Greg has a whole toolkit of available things to try when, when people run, run across a problem. Um, uh, and so he could have written to Greg and Greg would have told him the same thing or he, he Googled and found other people who had solved the problem. So that was, that was perfect. Apparently Katie 5 AMB in our chat room says, that, oh, that fixes my problem too. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. a lot of people with those Dell motherboards, that's for sure. Yep. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how TCP works, part one. Yes. Steve Gibson continues in his explanation of how the Internet works in great technical detail. But before we do that... Put on your, put on your propeller hats. Put on your propeller hats. Before we do that, we're going to... Uh, this will be something you can do after the show to relax. Watch Netflix go... Hi, hi, hi. That's what I do. I go home. I put my feet up. I, I have to admit, I keep my laptop in my lap, but then I'm watching Netflix movies on my Roku box. You can watch them on your Mac, your PC. Works great on the iPad. It turns the iPad into a personal television, your iPhone. Many Android devices, new Android devices all the time. Uh, what else? PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, many Blu-ray players, Nintendo Wii. Pretty much anything you hook up to your TV, you can get Netflix on. It's the gold standard. And Netflix streaming is fantastic. Um, they, they have tens of thousands of movies, TV shows, documentaries. Um, my daughter is right now, as we speak, <laughs> watching Netflix in our, in our lobby because she's sitting at the front desk and it's intensely boring because nobody ever visits us. Please come visit us. Keep, keep Abby entertained. But she's, but she's going through, she's never seen 30 Rock. So she's now going through all the old episodes of 30 Rock. You could do this too. Forget this, $7.99 a month. Unlimited streaming. So many great movies and TV shows await you. Now, I know everyone I'm talking to on this show is already a Netflix member. How could you not be? But I'll tell you what, uh, if, if you aren't, Try it free for 30 days at netflix.com slash twit. And if you are, help us out. Tell your friends. Just say, hey, open the window. Shout it out there. Go down the street. Hand out flyers. Netflix.com slash twit. An entire 30 days free of Netflix streaming movies. The best. Oh, such great stuff. Fritz the Cat. Remember that? That was the first X-rated cartoon ever. <laughs> I, you know, I'd probably, probably be pretty tame these days. Uh, and for the kids, oh, Secretariat, what a great movie. Netflix.com slash twit. Give it a try today. All right, Steve Reno, let's talk about... Now, I, you know, usually we say TCP IP. TCP slash IP. Um, what is that? Uh, t what is TCP? Terminal Control Protocol? Transmission control, Transmission control protocol. protocol, internet protocol. How does TCP relate to IP? Why do we bundle them together like that? Yeah, it's interesting. I I remember in the beginning sort of being being curious about the same thing. It's like, okay, well, what about UDP IP and right. ICMP IP? Right. Um, and I think that is is really that 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 demonstrates what I was saying earlier, which is the importance of TCP. TCP is a peer, really an equal peer, with ICMP, UDP, and, and other protocols that are, that are all riding on top of the IP protocol. So it's called the TCP IP stack traditionally, and we talk about TCP IP, but in fact, I don't know why, but you know, ICMP, UDP, and the other guys just don't get equal billing. But... Um, so the idea is that, as, as we originally talked about, the, the Internet is, is, it exists as a confederation of interconnected routers where routers connect users and services and servers to, to each other through links that individual packets move around. We talked a couple weeks ago about the UDP protocol because it's very simple. Essentially, the, the IP protocol thinks in terms of IP addresses, and then that carries other protocols sort of on top of it, UDP being one, 
UDP adds the notion of ports. So you can have a source port and a destination port, each which are 16 bits. So that's where you get the 65, 535 ports, because zero is not a valid port number. So one through 65535 are the number of combinations of 16 bits. You, so UDP just adds that to IP. So you have a, a port number, a source port number, and a source IP, a destination port number and a destination IP, and then whatever payload the UDP packet wants to carry with it. The problem with UDP is that that's all it is. I mean, that's all it does. So a sender who puts a packet onto the internet aimed at a destination IP doesn't know what's going to happen. The, as we've talked about, the genius of, this, of the architecture of the internet was that routers made their best effort to forward packets in the direction of their destination, but that's all. And if their queues got too full, uh, if too many packets were like coming in from four different places and all trying to go out through one, you could imagine that there'd be a congestion there. Well, the routers have the right by, by agreement to just discard packets that they don't have time to send or that for whatever reason they choose not to. The router might receive the packet and then crash. Routers could go down. Links could drop. So all kinds of things could happen that, would, that could cause a packet not to arrive at its destination. The other thing that can happen is that packets could arrive out of sequence. That is, because routers have, the, have the, again, the, the right to choose which links they send packets from or, or, or forward them to, one link might be busy. So the router says, oh, I've got another link here. So it would send a packet, a, a, a second packet down a different link. Well, that one might have a shorter path to its destination so that, so that it arrives before one that was actually sent prior to it, which is to say that the order of the packets arriving is not guaranteed the way the internet was designed. So there's also there's a problem with reliability and with out of orderness. So the designers of the internet said, okay, we've created this wacky kind of strange foundation, packet switched networking, but what happens when applications just want to send a file? Uh, you know, you want all the pieces of the file to arrive. You need them to arrive somehow and to be reassembled in the right order. You don't want pieces of your file scrambled around. So we need, on top of this admittedly, and even by design, sort of rickety foundation, we need to take responsibility for its ricketiness. And so that's what they did with TCP. They, the, and that's the brilliance of this, is because that foundation was assumed to be error prone, just by its nature, even when it's working perfectly, it might not deliver packets at all, or they might deliver them out of sequence. So that, that, that's, that's part of the genius is that they then said, okay, now we have to design around those problems. So we need to somehow impose order from chaos. So they said, first of all, we're going to, we're going to create an abstraction called a connection. A, remember, traditionally, a connection was actual wires connected between here and there. And you, you had your own pair of wires connected. That's the way the phone system used to work. Is, is, is if any of our listeners ever remember like, the, like pictures of the old phone switching rooms, they were huge banks of relays that, that, that as you dialed, stepped up and stepped over 
to take your pair of wires and connect them to another pair, which then stepped up and over to another pair and so forth. So you're actually connecting your wires to somebody else's wires. The Internet broke that model with this concept of packets of data. But, but for an application, for example, for a web browser, a web browser doesn't, it, it's, not, it's not its job to worry about the vagaries of, of packets. It simply wants to view the Internet as a reliable connection between it and a server, where it's able to send something and know that it's going to get there, and, and the receiver of a query, for example, sends a reply, and it knows it's going to get there. So what we needed to build was we needed to build a layer on top of IP with all of its known and designed-in problems to, to essentially insulate anything running above from all of the problems of what goes on below. So this notion of, of connecting endpoints was what was created, a, a pure intellectual abstraction. The way this was done is that every byte which is sent is numbered. It's, they're counted. And the sender numbers the bytes, and the recipient acknowledges the bytes that are received. So if, if packets are lost along the way, the recipient won't acknowledge those. The, the way, what, what, what happens is the acknowledgement is the, the, the highest numbered packet received in order. So if, if packets did come in out of order, then the recipient would hold that packet assuming that the missing one might be arriving here any second to fill in a gap, in which case the recipient would acknowledge everything it had received up to that point. But if, if, it's, if it just sits there waiting for a gap to be filled in, which isn't, it will not acknowledge. And at some point, the sender notices that it's, it's only got an acknowledgement up to a certain point. So it thinks, hmm, okay, enough time has gone by, and I haven't heard from the other end, so I'm going to resend this again. So one of the things that TCB does is it autonomously resends lost data in order to make up for that loss. Um, what that means is it has to buffer down sort of in its, in its layer it needs to buffer all outbound data until it has been acknowledged by the other end, which is to say that the application running above sends data down to TCP to be sent and, and then doesn't give it a second thought. The application is able to trust that TCP will achieve its goals of guaranteeing that it gets sent. The TCP protocol layer that there, thereby receives the data and holds it until it has been affirmatively acknowledged by the other end, at which point it's able to let go of that data because it knows that it's been sent. It will not have to resend it again. So how does all this happen? The, the first thing that occurs when a... a connection initiator wants to connect to a, a connection receiver. Typically, for example, in, in the model we're all familiar with, we're, we're sitting in front of a computer using a web browser. And so we're, we want to initiate a connection to a server, and that server is listening for incoming TCP connections from anywhere in the world. It's it, you know, the, the internet is global. In the typical case, anyone anywhere in the world can initiate a connection to a server anywhere in the world, barring you know 
nation state firewalls and, and Chinese firewalls and so forth. In general, it's just a, an open global network. So the connection initiator sends what's called a, an, a synchronized packet, a, a, or it's also called a SYN, S-Y-N is the first three letters of synchronize. It sends, the initiator sends a, a SYN packet to the, the connection recipient, the one who is, is open, waiting for incoming connections. What that packet does is it contains a, it contains a, um, a declaration of the endpoint. If, if we're going to have a connection, we need to have endpoints. So the endpoint is identified by the one endpoint, the, the initiating endpoint, by the source IP and source port, and the other endpoint is, in, is identified by the destination IP and destination port. IPs are 32 bits, ports are 16. So together that's 48 for each endpoint, and, and you merge those and you get 96 bits. So essentially it's the uniqueness of a local port and IP and a remote port and IP is the identity of a connection. And that's one of the reasons we have ports on our computers is we might want to have multiple connections to the same location. For example, my browser might want to open three or four different simultaneous connections to a single remote location, to like to google.com. So we would always be connecting to Google's IP at Google's port for, for services like port 80, that would be constant. But on our, on our local end, we would always be using our own IP, but we would then, we would disambiguate the traffic by using four different local ports. So the ports being different allows the, the, this, this four tuple containing source port, source IP, remote port, remote IP, they, they all have to match up in order to identify a connection. We use four different local ports to essentially create four different connection abstractions. So, so this SYN packet is the connection initiating packet. It, it contains the local port, the source port that we, will be, that we will be connecting from and our IP and inherently contains the remote port which would be typically port 80 if we were connecting to a web server. Um, it might be 110 if we were connecting to a remote POP server or 143 for um, a, a remote IMAP server and so forth. Uh, 25 for a remote SMTP server. Those are the so-called well-known port numbers. The idea being that, that a remote IP could have different services listening on different ports for incoming TCP connections, and each of those ports implies a different service. SMTP, listening on port 80, implies the use of SMTP protocol over the TCP connection, where the protocol, the SMTP protocol, is, is layered on top of TCP. So the SYN packet, the most important thing the SYN packet has, in addition to declaring this is the source port and, and source IP and destination port and destination IP is a sequence number. Thus, the word sequence and, and SYN, that, which is to say it declares that to the recipient, I'm going to start numbering all of the bytes that I'm going to be sending you from the following count, and that's a 32-bit count. So that's, we know that 32 bits is 4 gigs. So, so the, the sender says, just make a note on the receiving end that as I start sending you things, I'm going to be counting the bytes I'm sending you starting from this number. So the server receives the SYN, and if, it, if there's something listening on that port number, like on port 80, and it's willing to accept a connection and 
and ready to do so, it will reply with a sin ack. Um, it, this is a, a synchronize and acknowledgement. It's actually, two, it's like a two-part packet. The sin part is its own numbering scheme. That is, it is telling the, the connection originator that, okay, you're go- I've, I've, I've received your sin, and I've made note of how you're going to be numbering your bytes. I'm going to, I'm assuming you're going to want something back from me because a, a TCP connection, although it doesn't have to be, it is inherently a full duplex connection, meaning that each end is able to, at any time, at will, send data to the other end. The connection can be brief. It, you, it, it can be connected. Uh, uh, something is sent and it can be dropped. Something can be sent and received and then dropped. Or it can be persistent. And it can last as long as both ends agree that they have a connection. Because, And this is sort of a cool thing about TCP. The, the, this, the reason I say this is an abstraction of a connection is it's just their agreement that creates this. It's a virtual connection. The endpoints are connected only if and because they agree, they both agree that they are. So the the server side sends back this SYNAC packet. The SYN portion, as I said, is its corresponding starting numbering of the bytes at its of the data bytes it's going to be sending and the ack is its acknowledgement of the receipt of the initiator's sin the f- upon receiving the sin ack packet the connection initiator sends its final packet acknowledging the receipt of the server's sin side so so really there's a sin and an act, which pa- a, 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 a declaration and an acknowledgement, a sin and an act, which passes in b- between both endpoints in each direction. And because they're, they're overlapped, we only need three packets to make that happen. And so that's c- called the TCP three-way handshake because the endpoints are establishing each other, and the numbering for the bytes which follow. Well, several important things are also going on because we know how crazy the Internet is with with routers and sort of this very ad hoc means of routing packets. It's conceivable with the way routers are set up that, that traffic flowing from endpoint A to endpoint B will flow over a given path, jumping between routers to get there, and that the reverse traffic coming from from endpoint B back to endpoint A, nothing says it has to go the same route. It could, for whatever reason, there might be a, a faster link in a different direction or uh, you know who knows what, but there's not, 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 nothing guarantees that the like data in each direction is going to be passing its uh, each other over the same link. They could be easily be going on different routes, but it also says that there may not be a route back. There may not be any way for traffic to get back just because of something being broken. So, so the beauty of this this TCP three-way handshake is that it validates to each endpoint that the other is able to receive its traffic. When the sender sends its SYN packet, the, the initiator, the connection initiator, sends its SYN packet and receives a SYN ACK from this, the server, it knows the server got its its request to open a connection and it knows that it's able to receive traffic back from the server similarly when the when the final ack packet is sent by the connection initiator the server knows of course it knows that it, it originally got the sin packet from the 
from the, the connection requester, but it sent off a synac. It, it doesn't know unless it gets that final ack of its sin back that the connection initiator was able to receive its traffic. So getting that final acknowledgement back does verify that. So now each endpoint, they've, they've found each other, they verified that they're able to exchange traffic back and forth, and importantly, they've each declared the starting point for the numbering of their bytes. Now, why don't they just use zero, you might ask. Like, okay, what, what's with this 32-bit counter? Why not just always start numbering from zero? The reason is, again, the, the craziness of the Internet. As I mentioned, connections might be persistent or might be short-lived. And we might be connecting between the same ports, that is the same two endpoints, over and over and over. It might be that we, we grab a local port, we connect to a, a, a remote web server, make a query, receive a response, drop our connection, but then we decide, oh, we got something else we want to ask it. So we, we, we grab the same endpoint and, and connect again and so forth. The problem is if we always started numbering our data from zero, it's possible that data from a previous connection could be confused with data from this connection. That is, if we always started at zero, because the Internet is as ad hoc and, and prone to crazy behavior as it is, for example, say that a packet was delayed and that so because of the delay, one of the, 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 the receiver that was waiting for the packet got tired of waiting and sent out the data again. So we know that there can be duplication of data on the Internet in addition to, to data being lost. So what could conceivably happen is uh, a, 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 a short-lived connection is brought up and then torn down and then brought up again, yet due to the vagaries of packet delay, it's, it's conceivable that old traffic from the prior connection could be confused with new traffic from a reconnection. So smart as these guys were who originally designed this, they recognized that problem and they said, okay, let's agree that we're, we're, we're going to use a 32-bit count and, and, and they just used that so that they had plenty of margin, especially compared to, to, to speeds before. And the idea is that, that as we send data to the other side, we're going to be advancing this counter with the number of bytes sent in each packet so that the, so that the sequence number continues to advance in an upward pointing direction. And if it, if it, hits the 32-bit limit, it'll just be allowed to wrap around back to zero in the, in the same way that binary numbers wrap around when, when they get maxed out, and that's fine. What we want to make sure, though, is that the, the number is big enough, that is, there, there's so, there are so many combinations, binary combinations of this sequentially numbered byte ordering that there's, it's just inconceivable that, that traffic would be still floating around the Internet long enough that it could ever be confused with, with earlier traffic that just hadn't died during a connection. And so they said, okay, let's just make it four bytes. We'll make it 32 bits of traffic. That's four billion bytes of, of, of traffic. Certainly, that'll give us enough headroom. And it, it turns out that it did. Um, that, has, that has not turned out to be a problem. And so, so after the SYN, the SYNAC, and the ACK packets, then the, this full duplex connection is established, and either end is able to send the other data 
over this virtual connection whenever it wants to. It it looks at the the amount of data it's sending and advances its sequence number um, that it's sending in that packet to point to the last the, the number of the last byte that it is sending and it puts that packet on the internet and the routers send it towards its destination and it it then takes another packet and adds data to that advances that same sequence number again up by the amount of data that it is put into this next packet so that the last byte of the packet is the number which it is declaring as part of this packet and sends it off. The recipient of that data has the job of acknowledging the, the as I said earlier, the last in order byte that it has reassembled of that sender's data. So if packets are lost, it, doesn't, it has no way of knowing that they're lost. The recipient doesn't know that more data is being sent because there's never a declaration ahead of time at, at the TCP level of how much data is going to be sent. It simply receives it as it comes in if, and, and it, it looks at how much data is in the packet and then, and then moves the, this numbering forward as, 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 as far as, it, as, as the amount of data in the packet would indicate and acknowledges back to the sender that it has received up to this much data correctly. So if it, if it gets a, a packet in, out of order, it waits to see if the other one is going to come in, uh, whether or not it does. Um, it, because it's TCP, it knows that if the sender does not receive an affirmative acknowledgement within a certain expiring length of time, the sender w has buffered that data and is able to send it again. And it will send it again and again and again, trying over and over and over until the data finally gets through and the recipient of that data has acknowledged the last byte which has been sent. All of these TCP packets contain both a synchronized field and an acknowledgement field. And the beauty of that is that this, this being a full duplex connection, they are able to they are able to simultaneously send data in each direction. And the acknowledgement field of of the packets going in each direction is always acknowledging how much data has uh, how much in order data has been received up to that point while the sin field is always is, is always acknowledge is always setting the the expected byte numbering of the data in the packet so so this this flow in each direction is act, is is have is having a dual role it is it is able to send new data to the other side numbering that as expected and at, at the same packet contains an acknowledgement field of any data that's been received. And so, so that's, in a nutshell, the way endpoints identify themselves, how ports are, quote, open, which is the term we use for one that is accepting TCP connections, how connections are established, and how data is numbered, and how duplicate data is ignored, how lost data is retransmitted in order, uh, if that occurs, in order to guarantee the, the receipt, and ultimately how each end is able to reassemble a coherent block of data that the sender has sent. And this is all the responsibility of the TCP protocol, the application, the web browser, the, the email client, the, the web server, the email server, whatever the application level is, it knows it's able to trust TCP to get the job done.
next week, or actually in a in a few weeks from now, when we pick this up again, because we're gonna we're we're gonna talk a little bit in two weeks after our uh, next week's Q and A, we're gonna talk about um, uh, certificate authorities and as as we said, um, looking again at the whole CA structure. When we come back to TCP, which we will in our next available slot, I'm going to talk about the hacks which have been created as a consequence of this. We've talked about denial of service, sin floods, um, and, 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 the, and the problems those create. And then we'll look at what's, what was done in order to make this all go faster, because as the Internet has gotten bigger, in terms of its, its, its diameter, the number of router hops, um, bandwidth has been strained, and it's necessary to come up with ways of allowing the sender to know how much data that has not yet been acknowledged it's able to send ahead, and that allows it to essentially not have to wait for everything it sends to get acknowledged. So there's lots more cool stuff to talk about uh, in the way the TCP protocol operates. And we'll pick up where we left off. It's very elegant, very straightforward, and it gets the job done, as we can see. It works. It works. It works. Yeah. We're using it all the time. Yeah. Well, Steve, this, that, this is fun. So um, uh, next week we do Q&A, which means if you want to ask a question of Steve, you can go to grc.com slash feedback, and we'll pick 10 good questions. Steve will answer those. Um, you know, we've been doing, Steve's been doing all along with Security Now, these these go deep explanations of how things work, how a computer works, how the internet works. So if you like this and you want to know more, I mean, you, you this is, you, you've got 316 other episodes to listen to. And uh, if you look at the name, it'll be very obvious, you know, where the ones where we explain, where he, I say we, he explains how stuff works. So uh, the chat room gives you a standing ovation, by the way, Steve. Oh, they are, no kidding. They enjoyed this quite a bit, yeah. Neat. <laughs> so uh, G if you'll find the, all the shows at grc.com, uh, along with Spinrite, Steve's Bread and Butter, and the world's best hard drive maintenance utility. Uh, his free stuff like the Off the Grid and the Perfect Paper Password, all the things that Steve does such a great job with. Do read the Password Haystacks uh, article. That's a great one that uh, will change the way you do uh, passwords. And, of course, lots of free software like Wismo and I guess nobody really needs to shoot the messenger a decombobulator anymore. Unplug and Not pray. Not so much. They're still there for old timers. <laughs> Trouble in paradise. <laughs> if anybody has a zip disk, it's clicking. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's oh, possible goodness. somebody finds some zip disks in the attic and says, well, I wonder what's on here and gets the click of death. You know, things like that. Yep. Um, so grc.com. He also put 16 kilobit versions there for people uh, who don't have a lot of bandwidth and full transcripts too if you like to read along, which is frankly a great way. Uh, to, to follow along uh, what Steve's saying. You, I know uh, I've talked to many people who, who actually use Security Now in the classroom. A um, lot of college courses, uh, Security Now is required listening. So the transcripts are useful for those uh, folks as well. GRC.com. Of course, we have it all to a twit.tv. Steve, thanks so much for uh, joining us. And uh, we'll be back. We've, we've, we've flipped days again for Paul Thorat. Next week, we'll be back on our Wednesday, regular Wednesday schedule. That's 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live. I, I keep saying live at twit.tv. Don't need that anymore. Just our new site now. It's right there on the front page, twit.tv. Thanks, Steve. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Leo. On Security Now. Security.